Good morning, church. Welcome to worship at Wesley United Methodist. My name is Sarah Isbell. My pronouns are she, her. I'm the senior pastor here at Bloomington Wesley, and I am so pleased to welcome you to the service of worship. I'd invite everybody to sign in their attendance if they don't mind doing so, please. The attendance pads are in your pew on the inside aisle. But we especially want to welcome those who may be guests or visitors with us today. So glad that you are here. So glad that you are here, those of you online. And I know some of us are worshiping right at nine, and some of us are going to do it a little bit later in the day because it is time change weekend after all. But welcome uh, to everybody this morning. I'm so glad that you have joined us. We are still in our series on When Christians Get It Wrong by Adam Hamilton. And this week we are doing chapter five, When Christians Get It Wrong, regarding the LGBTQ community. Now let me say a couple of things about that before we begin. First of all, the chapter heading is actually When Christians Get It Wrong when dealing with homosexuality. But we are changing the title just slightly to be to the LGBTQ community. Why? Because what we want to emphasize today is that this is not about an issue. This conversation is not about a topic. It's about people. It's about a community. It's about our very own siblings here in the sanctuary, in our families, in our circles of friends. This is about us. And so today we're going to be talking about the church dealing with the LGBTQIA plus community. Now let me say, I'm looking forward to this morning. I think we have some important things to talk about, and I'm kind of excited for some of the plans that we have today. But I'm also very aware that this is not the best ideal format for a conversation. What I mean by that is, it is really important that we be able to talk about issues, that we trust and respect each other well enough to look each other in the eye and talk about what's important to our hearts. And this unidirectional format where I have a microphone and you do not, (laughs) does not lend itself beautifully uh, to that kind of exchange. And so being cognizant of that, um, I'll just say, I will be doing the sermon this morning, and I'll be the only person giving the sermon, but I would very much welcome your feedback and your input. You can find my email address on the church website, and I hope that you'll give me feedback, email, let me know if you agree, if you disagree. It's never essential that you agree with me. It's always essential that we respect and care for one another. Um, And in addition, this is a great time to join a small group. If you have not been in any of the Lenten study groups, this would be a great week to just pop in because this is a topic and this is a community that really deserves that kind of exchange. So I invite you to do that if you're willing and if you're able uh, that we might engage this topic, this community a little bit more deeply. Uh, We don't have a screen. This morning, as you may have observed, something funky is going on with the tech. Very sorry about that. But you should be able to participate between the bulletin and the hymnal and us pitching in for each other. I think we will be okay. All that in mind, I invite you to center your hearts and minds now for worship, beginning with the brass.
Let us stand and join together in our call to worship. And you will find it in our bulletin. God is calling us. Out of the places we hide. Out of insecurity. Out of shame. Out from under that which silences love and justice. Come, Come out, out, people of God. Though we may be afraid. Though we will be at risk. Though the cross stands as a threat. God calls us to courage. Our God is a God of resurrection. Of new life after devastation. Of hope in the grip of evil. And so we dare to proclaim with pride and faith our truths. We believe in the power of love. We believe in solidarity with the suffering. We believe we are each valuable. We believe that our togetherness is transformative. The world is longing for holy truths that reveal voices that speak real words of hope. Come out, people of God. Please be seated. In the absence of a screen, we'll be listening to our choir perform from the, the faith we sing. You'll know we are Christians by our love. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord, we are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord, and we pray that all unity may one day be restored, and they'll know we are Christians by by our love. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. And together we'll spread the news that God is in our land. Will you please stand with me again for our opening prayer?
Gracious God, may we be a people known by our love, your love. Love for each other, love for you, love for those outside the walls of your church. Show us how to open our doors, minds, and hearts to all. Amen. May you be seated.
Good morning. My name is Kathy Pritz. Can I have the children come forward for the children's message? Way over here, you guys. Can you guys come way over here? Anywhere on the floor where you can see what I'm doing, too, though. Remember, we started talking last week about being Christ-like. Anybody remember, what does that mean to be Christ-like? What do you think? It means we want to be like him. That's what Christians want to be. That's our goal, to be more and more like Christ all the time. As we grow up and as we grow older, we want to be more and more like Christ. Can you see this word right here? That's what we talked about last week. Anybody could know that word right up there? Humble, or to have humility. We talked about that as a Christ-like thing last week. What does that mean? That's kind of a weird word. What does that mean to be humble? It, it's easier to explain what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean you stand up and say, I am the greatest. I want everybody to look at me. I want everybody to think about me. I want everything to be about me. That's not what humble is. But that is what Jesus is. This word, this big, long word right here, is what we're going to talk about today. Oh, you got it, XJ? Compassionate. Compassionate. That's a long word. What does that word mean? To be compassionate. Any ideas? Well, I will tell you. It's a little bit easier to explain than humble. To be compassionate just means you care. It means you care about people. And let me see, let me put Jesus back up here. He was up here last week. And I want to put this up, because you guys know this story. Jesus shows compassion, or he cares about these people. Who are these people? Children, yeah, we know that story. In Jesus' day, a lot of people did not show compassion or did not think children were important enough to talk to or to be around Jesus. Here's another group. What about this? In Jesus' day, who do you think that is, XJ? It's an adult. It's a woman. In Jesus' day, a lot of people didn't think women were important enough to be around Jesus or talk to Jesus. But what did Jesus show all of these people? Compassion. Yeah, he cared about all of these people. Even if the people in his time did not show compassion, Jesus always shows compassion to everyone. And remember, as Christians, that's our goal to be Christ-like. And these are a couple things we can do or we can practice to be more like Jesus. Can you guys fold your hands and bow your head? Thank you, God, for helping us be more and more like you all the time. We love you and we want to be like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May we close our eyes and open our hearts in prayer. Dear God, in our depths of our soul is a deep desire to be closer with you, 
to understand the difficulties and the mysteries of the life that we live and to walk in union and peace with each other in community. In this process, we learn more about each other. We grow in discipleship and faith and that we pray this day as well as the days to come that they prove to be better for ourselves and our health and our relationships and our understanding and our community and our discipleship. Let this day serve as a moment in that, just one step along the way to becoming better Christians, mending fences and getting things right where we've been wrong before. Like the disciples who met together for the Last Supper, let us pray as you tie your disciples too, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thanks, y'all, for doing so well without the screen. You're adapting beautifully. This morning's scripture comes from the Old Testament prophet book of Isaiah, chapter 43. And as I think about the words of this morning's scripture, I think about how well they reflect the anthem that the choir sang this morning. You are mine. That was beautiful, choir. Thank you so much. So this is sort of the scripture version of that same message. And this is for everyone who has ever wondered whether they belong. You can turn with me to Isaiah 43 in your Bibles if you want, or just listen. But now, thus says the Lord, the one who created you, O Jacob, the one who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you up. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away, and my daughters from the end of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Do not remember the former things, or consider the things of old. I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Here ends the reading. So just a couple things I wanna say before we begin. First of all, I would like to clarify some of the terminology that I'll be using in this morning's sermon so that nobody is confused. So LGBTQ 
stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer. Those are terms that are widely accepted, widely used, and they're accepted by those whom they describe. Now the IA plus that you sometimes see tacked onto the end, that stands for intersex, I is for intersex, which means bodies that don't conform to the traditional male-female binary. And A is for asexual, sometimes shortened to ace, which means experiencing little or no sexual attraction. So I'm not gonna be talking about those two topics specifically, but if I mention LGBTQIA, I want you to know what I'm talking about. The plus at the end means that, frankly, we're still learning about the gender and sexual varieties of people in this world, and there may be more alphabet letters than we even know about or can mention in one phrase. Now, a word I will be using that you may or may not be familiar with is cisgender, C-I-S, gender. Cisgender is used in contrast with transgender, which is the sense of one's own gender identity being different from that which was assigned at birth. Transgender persons may identify as male or female or both or neither, but what they all have in common is that they often have to convince other people that they are who they say they are. Cisgender people, like me, don't have that burden. Everybody assumes that they are as they appear to be. They don't have to fight for their rights to choose their own pronouns or to use a public restroom or just to fill out a form. So, as I said, I, for example, am cisgender. I identify as female. That's what I was assigned at birth, and that's how I present. It's pretty easy for me, and I have often taken that ease for granted. Recently, though, I've started introducing myself, sometimes, by saying that I use she, her pronouns, even though to most people that probably seems obvious. But to identify my pronouns is to send a signal to those who may use less common pronouns or less obvious ones that it's okay to talk about pronouns. It is okay to choose what you want to be called. So all that's my first point. My second point is this. I am fully aware that talking about sexuality and gender identity in the church can make some people really uncomfortable. Some of you, I think, really want to hear what I have to say about Christianity and the LGBTQ community. Some of you may be not so sure. And I get that. I understand. Because I wouldn't want to sit and listen to a sermon that might make me feel uncomfortable or ashamed either. So I want to start by just reassuring you at this point. This sermon will not shame LGBTQIA plus persons. It will not shame straight or cisgender persons. It will not shame liberals. It will not shame conservatives. The title of the sermon and the series, When Christians Get It Wrong, will not be used to suggest that one interpretation or another interpretation of the Bible is wrong, or that anybody is wrong for being who they are and doing the best they can. What Adam Hamilton and I hope to do, rather, is to say that Christians get it wrong with regards to human sexuality and the LGBTQIA community when we use our religion to hurt people, when we tell them that God doesn't love them, or that we've decided they are going straight to hell. Now, that shouldn't be any surprise to anyone, right? I suspect that most of us would agree it's not very nice to treat any child of God that way. Gay or straight, transgender, cisgender, married, single, or partnered. No one should have to feel unwelcome here. Every person is loved by God and of sacred worth. And frankly, we have no business judging anybody's worthiness for the kingdom of heaven. What's unique about the church's response to LGBTQIA persons, though, is that of all the different kinds of people in the world, black, white, male, female, rich, poor, gay, lesbian, gay and lesbian people are the only ones 
most specifically condemned and broadly excluded by many Christian churches. Now that is not to say that racism doesn't still exist in the church, it does. Sexism also. We do not yet love the way that Jesus did. The body of Christ is not yet fully who we are called to be. I mean, for example, single people tell me that the church seems to favor married people and families. Young people say that the church is stuck in the past and no one wants to hear their new ideas. People who work on Sunday mornings say the church isn't offering them anything at all. Fair enough. These are all things we need to work on. But the denominational policy books of most religious traditions, namely in our tradition, the Book of Discipline, does not single out anybody else's lives and loves as incompatible with Christian teaching. Now, I don't know what you think about that, but but how would it feel to be told that because of who you've fallen in love with, you are incompatible with Christian teaching? And the Book of Discipline doesn't specifically limit anybody else's right to marry, or question anybody else's call to ministry. Only gay and lesbian people are prevented from loving who they want to love and serving God the way that they want to serve solely on the basis of sexual orientation. So that is why this book and this sermon are focusing today on LGBTQIA community. Because this is a community that the wider church has specifically and intentionally excluded and harmed. Now, when the church does that, exclude and harm, it usually finds its justification in Scripture. For generations, the church justified its acceptance of slavery on the basis of Scripture. Same with women in church leadership. The reason the United Methodist Church and other denominations hold these exclusionary policies about gay and lesbian people is because there are certain passages of scripture, seven in all out of over 31,000, which seem to suggest that people who have same gender sexual relations are condemned by God. And in fact, some Bible translations go so far as to call them an abomination. So I want to say right away, I don't believe that. I have LGBTQ people in my family, among my friends and my colleagues, and not one of them is an abomination. Every one of them are wonderful, kind-hearted, precious children of God. And I cannot imagine that God loves them any less than I do. On the contrary, I find that God has gifted them with sharp minds, open hearts, creative spirits that I believe can bless the church if we just give them a chance. It's our loss if we reject the gifts and graces of so many people, all on account of seven verses of scripture. Now, if you're curious about those seven verses, I want to direct you to chapter five of Adam Hamilton's When Christians Get It Wrong. That is the chapter that our small groups will be discussing this week. Hamilton gives a very brief, succinct rundown of the verses often used to condemn homosexual orientation and practice, unpacking them each just far enough to show why he doesn't think they should be used to discriminate against LGBTQ plus people. I would encourage you to read chapter five, even if you don't read anything else in the book. But there really is not time for us to do that work in the sermon this morning, or the work that Hamilton does, or the work that dozens of other really good books do. Later in the service, we'll be directing you to the RMN, the Reconciling Ministries Network Task Force Resource Table, which will be available for you in the garden room along with your donuts and coffee. There are a lot of really good books that do a good and a thorough job of unpacking all this, helping us examine the biblical witness more thoroughly. I just want to share with you this morning one general overall truth that for me makes the whole handful of scriptures in inadequate justification for excluding lesbian and gay people, relationships, and calling. 
And that one overall truth is this. The concept of homosexuality as an orientation, in other words, as a way that some people are just wired toward same gender attraction and love, is a modern 19th century concept, not a biblical one. Before 1867, homosexual behaviors were called unnatural because they could not produce offspring, which is really kind of the main purpose of 19th century sex, or abnormal because they exhibited an excess of sexual energy. In other words, men had sexual relations with men not because they were in love with other men, but because their passions exceeded that which their wives could satisfy. Even the words homosexuality and heterosexuality, which are defined, by the way, as an enduring pattern of emotional, romantic, and or sexual attractions to persons of the same or the opposite sex, those words weren't invented until 1868, and the word bisexuality came along a year later in 1869. So why is all this history important? Because the writers of the Bible, living long before the 19th century, had no way of understanding that homosexuality, heterosexuality, bisexuality, asexuality are hardwired traits of a person's character and identity. They had no way of knowing that sexual behavior between two men or between two women might not be just an excess of passions, a waste of man's seed and woman's womb that God had designed for childbirth, but a consistent, integral, internal disposition. Sexual behavior that didn't grow the population and strengthen the family structure wasn't good for the community as far as they were concerned. The traditional gender roles of a patriarchal society simply didn't leave room for the possibility of monogamous, loving, same-sex relationships. In other words, if your Bible uses the word homosexual anywhere in the Old Testament or the New, that word doesn't belong there any more than words like gravity or epilepsy or meteor or astigmatism, all of which surely existed in Old Testament days and Bible times, but they were not written about in the scriptures. The Bible was written hundreds of years before any modern understanding of sexual orientation. And it cannot, therefore, in my mind, condemn or even speak to that subject. Now, of course, this also means that the Bible does not specifically condone homosexuality either, or, for that matter, heterosexuality, as it is defined today. The scriptures simply tell us of an ancient and precious people whom God commanded to marry and multiply and fill the earth as a light to the nations. Okay, there is much more to be said about this, and as I've said, there's much more to be read about this, both in terms of how the scientific community understands sexual orientation and in terms of how the Bible addresses human sexuality in general. This would be a great week, did I mention, to pop in on a Lenten study group. If you haven't had a chance, you don't have to sign up ahead of time. There may be more opportunity to unpack all this. But at this point, I just want to ask you this question. If it's true, as I believe it is, that the Bible does not actually talk about homosexual persons and orientation at all, then is there any justification for excluding them from full participation in the church? So our young people don't think so. They represent and have friends who represent a variety of orientations and identities, just like they represent a variety of racial ethnic backgrounds, religious traditions, family sizes and structures and shapes and configurations, they speak a variety of languages, and they choose for themselves a wide diversity of names. But all of them are created by God in the image of the very same God 
who created the rest of us. Though younger generations do tend to display God's colors and creativity a little more boldly than some of us are accustomed to. But LGBTQ people have the same hopes and fears, the same dreams and dreads, the same need all of us do to be accepted, to be loved, to be forgiven and free, to know they belong. They all need God just like all of us do. And so we do great harm, in my opinion, when we judge them from a distance, keep them away, when we condemn their lives and their loves and their friends. And in the end, it's not gonna be just a question of whether Christians will accept LGBTQ people, it's also a question of whether they will accept us. The integrity of our witness is at risk, it seems to me. Our commitment to follow the kind of Messiah who trusted women, welcomed children, ate with sinners, conversed with tax collectors and prostitutes, called all people together into beloved community and told them they were blessed. How we treat the least of these will ultimately tell them more about where we fall short than about their own sins and shortcomings. Because believe it or not, what judging another person won't do is change them. <laughs> change their sexual orientation or their gender identity. Despite the efforts of the institutional church over the years to make gay and lesbian people feel bad about who they are, Many LGBTQ plus Christians believe God has given them their sexuality as a gift, as a part of their faith identity. LGBTQ Christians are already part of the church, already worshiping and serving and praying and loving and leading and giving of themselves, already loved just the way they are. They are all saints and sinners, just like every one of us. Every one of us here stands in the need of grace. Every one of us has gifts to give. The church, it seems to me, should not make some of us hide in the closet or pretend to be something that we're not in order to be welcome. This morning's scripture, if you remember these words from Isaiah, speaks a word of comfort and assurance to all of us this morning that we are loved. We are chosen that God is doing a new thing in us. I know that change can be scary, but I want you to know that I believe God is doing a wonderful new thing in the church right now, making a way in the wilderness, making streams of living water in the desert. I believe that God is gathering the outcasts, calling everybody in from the margins, telling gay and straight, conservative and progressive and old and young that they're beloved, that they matter to God. Do not fear, God says through Isaiah, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. You're precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the end of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you perceive it? Now, if I've made you uncomfortable this morning, <laughs> Let me just clarify this moment. Does all this sermon mean that you are somehow a bad person if you are still not comfortable with the idea of same-sex marriage? No, no, of course not. I would just ask that you'd find it in your heart when interacting with other people to trust others to make their own choices about their own relationships and just leave the judging to God. How about if you're not sure that you're ready for an LGBTQ pastor? Again, no, you're not a bad person. And you're not alone. The decisions about whether or when the United Methodist Church may remove those restrictions 
on LGBTQIA members, those decisions can only happen at general conference. And there will be votes on all sides. More on that this afternoon at 2 o'clock, by the way. Mark your calendars. But you will always have a right to your own interpretations of the Bible, your own social political convictions, your own ideas of right and wrong. I never demand that anybody agrees with me or with anybody else here today as long as we can still love and respect each other. Because my conviction is, and I think maybe Adam Hamilton would agree with me, that Christians get it right when we commit to treating all people with dignity and respect. We get it right when we admit that we don't yet know all the answers and we will therefore leave the judging to God. We get it right when we commit to treat every person, gay or straight, cisgender, trans, partnered and single, as Jesus would treat them. And then they'll know we are Christians by our love. Amen. As we move toward the time of offering, I want to invite Ben Joe Lash and Judy Butte to the microphone. They'll be sharing a stewardship moment for us regarding um, the Reconciling Ministries Task Force, which is presenting today. Let me be clear, um, this is not about the Lenten offering. We're not taking up an offering today, although if you would like to donate, you can do that in the garden room later after the service. This is not about the Lenten offering, but this is about an initiative happening here at Wesley that we want you to know about. Good morning. I am Judy Butte. As Sarah said, I am one of the co-lay leaders at Wesley, but I'm up here today as a member of the Reconciling Ministry Network Task Force here at Wesley. We're going to tell you more about that. And I'm Ben Joe Lash. I'm a staff member that you've seen crawling and running around. You probably saw me crawling just earlier today. We're dealing with some tech issues. Uh, my pronouns are they, he, and I am also a part of the RMN task force here. Uh, yeah. Oh, I still keep going, don't I? Uh, what is RMN? RMN stands for Reconciling Ministries Network. It is a uh, organization that is made for the United Methodist Church um, that is, well, I have their mission and their focus here. Their mission is commitment to intersectional justice across and beyond the United Methodist Connection, working for the full participation of all LGBTQ plus people throughout the life and leadership of the church. And their focus is Reconciling Ministries Network celebrates that LGBTQ plus persons are a good expression of God's diverse creation and exists to advocate for the affirmation of all of God's children in the church and the world. Thanks, Benjo. You may be wondering what the task force is, how long this has been going, and you can find out a lot more information if you come to the coffee hour or if you attend the adult Sunday school today. But the task force is a group of clergy, lay people, and staff from Wesley who are trying to live out the RMN mission here. We've been meeting to educate ourselves, and now we're ready to start a conversation with the rest of the congregation to share what we've learned. And I just could add that I have learned so much and read so much that I am excited to share it with all of you. And so how are we facilitating the conversation at Wesley that we want to continue? Well, we've set up a question box at the front desk that you may have seen that anyone can ask questions anonymously or not anonymous, anonymously, if you wish. Um, and if you'd rather email, we have people who are willing to receive questions online. Unfortunately, we don't have the projector working to put those emails, but if you're interested in getting those emails, there will be um, emails. You can get those emails at the coffee hour. What is the coffee hour? We will be in the garden room hosting an RMN coffee hour where people can ask questions, engage in discussion, and also view recommended materials that we've collected. We'll also have a list of resources and a glossary of LGBTQ related terms. That will be happening right after the service in between services in the garden room where you get coffees and donuts and everything like that. There will be space for materials, like I said, and also space for discussion as well for asking questions or if you just wanna hang out. 
The question box that we mentioned will, rain up, will remain up indefinitely, so you can always reach out to members of the task force that way, or we'll introduce some, or we'll have the members of the task force who are here today stand in just a minute so you can see that, who they are. We also are going to offer some RMN related book study groups, and we have movie nights scheduled that will be documentaries that we'll show here at church, so you can learn some of the things that we've learned too. Um, if you're interested in any of these events, as Benjo said, you can pick up a flyer for upcoming movie nights at the welcome desk, and we have them in the garden room as well. And we're also setting up an RMN mailing list that you can sign up for on the RMN task force webpage on the church's website. For those of you that attend the adult Sunday school, as uh, Pastor Sarah mentioned, there, we'll have task force members who will come down to answer questions that you have down there too. So. Um, you won't miss out on anything by attending Sunday school. We on the task force have a strong desire to share what we have learned about fully embracing the grace and acceptance that Jesus Christ offers to everyone, including members of the LGBTQ plus community. May members of the RMN task force that are here please stand. You can recognize them in their awesome t-shirts that we are also wearing. Um, I believe all of them are willing to be approached if you have any questions. However, you also respect their personal space if they are not ready to answer a question at that moment. Um, you're also welcome to join us, like, like I said, in the coffee hour that we'll be having immediately after the service as well, um, where you'll see all or most of us, so, yeah. And now we'll invite the ushers forward for the offering. Thank you very much.
God of free grace and infinite mercy accepts these gifts given not only of our treasure, but of our time and our talent and our discernment for the establishment of the loving kingdom that your son exhaled. Continue in your glory and your holiness for the betterment of all the world for the transformation of it and let these gifts be a contribution to it. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Has this been here this whole time? Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Um, two quick announcements I wanted to share with you. They're both about today. If you would like to uh, engage in more conversation or learn a little bit more about the Reconciling Ministries Task Force, please join us in the garden room after church. Pick up your coffee and donut and join in conversation. We hope that you'll feel comfortable to do that. If you would like to know more about the United Methodist Church and what's going on with General Conference, We'll be having an informational meeting this afternoon at 2 o'clock p.m. It's information only. There will be a Zoom link if you want to participate that way. If the projector is still not working, we will not be in here. We will be maybe downstairs in Wesley Hall. So just watch for the sign on the door. Those are all the announcements. How about that? Would you stand as you're able? Our closing hymn is Be Thou My Vision. It's number 451. 451 in your red hymnal. Let's sing together. Friends, Christ is our vision. God's love is our vision. That is what we aspire to do and who we aspire to be. So go forth just to love, to listen, to show compassion, and to be as much like Jesus as you can possibly manage to be. Go in peace and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>